Okay, I hope that it is now working. Um, just bear with me. Sorry for the delay in, in sorting all of this out. A um, few technical issues along the way. Right. So I should now be able to see. Um, if you're unable to comment, there is actually another way for you to access this uh, or to, to, to view it. And it's actually via Zoom. So perhaps I will put a little code in for you guys to access. If you enter via Zoom, you can also then, I'll, I'll let you into the room, um, send any questions that you might have. Alternatively, you can email. Uh, the email is ahmed.alaskari at expert-tuition.co.uk. That's um, probably a good idea if I write it for you guys. Bear with me. So let's have a look. Okay, I'm just waiting for a few more people to enter the room just because, sorry for the delay in getting it all started. Uh, let's see if I'm able to comment using my phone. Can you comment whilst I write this? Let me just see. If you can comment, can someone comment? But I don't know if you can comment. In which case, let me put the code in. Bear with me. Okay, so. Eight three two five nine six three eight five three three, and the code is eight zero two zero nine three. Okay, right. Share my screen and show you guys the code. Right, those of you that are entering now, thank you. I, I will get started very very soon. Just want to make sure that as many people as possible can come in i know that the fa cup final has run into penalty shootouts so i'm assuming some people might still be watching the ending of that um right if you have a particular question that you would like to ask there are two options available to you either you can enter the room um this is the code for the room hopefully you guys can read my handwriting uh, or you can drop me an email i will be checking my email every now and then uh, my email is as follows And we will get started very, very soon. Tuition.co.uk. Okay. Those are your two options. If you could please note them down on a piece of paper because this screen will be moved uh, in, in, in a couple of minutes when we actually get started properly. Um, but yeah, those are your two ways of answering questions. You can either enter via Zoom and have this as the room and that as the code. Uh, alternatively, you can send an email please to me i will check my email as regularly as possible so okay we will wait just a few more minutes about 10 of you in the room some of you have thank you to those who have submitted questions via email already i'm um, in advance of the session and so i do definitely want to start with a couple of those questions to get started but for the time being i will wait just two more minutes if that's okay and then we will start pretty pretty soon um, just so that if anyone wants to enter this, the room, they can do so. Okay. I'm hoping you guys can see my screen. Okay, cool. Thank you. Right, we will wait until 7.40, and at 7.40, I am going to start. So we have one minute left, and then we will start just to give you guys time to enter the Zoom room if you'd like to join and ask questions that way. Uh, alternatively, like I said, please drop me an email um, with your questions, and we will get started.
All right, let's get started. So um, I assume most of you that are watching this are in year 13 and that your exam is around the corner. Um, and so hopefully this session will shed some light on some of the topics that may come up. Now, the difficulty with this particular Q&A comparative to previous years is that because I assume you are doing a variety of different exam boards, the advance notice provided to each exam board varies. Um, there are certain topics that overlap quite heavily between all of the exam boards. Um, and so I will do my best to address those. But bear in mind that although certain topics can not be examined or should not be examined by a particular exam board, economics is all interconnected in the sense that a particular topic, an example, monopsony is not part of the edXL advanced notice. But knowing about it doesn't hurt because actually you could use that as one of your points as to why, you know, oligopolistic power can translate into them having lower prices potentially because they have like high monopsony power. Things along those lines. Yeah. So I'm going to just start off. Uh, if you have any questions please feel free to send them over into uh, the chat via Zoom uh, or via email, and I will try to work my way through as many questions as I possibly can. Um, but I wanted to address some of the questions that came through to me via email over the last couple of days. In particular, a recurring theme that I seem to see is maths, the maths involved in the questions that I might face in an exam. How do I deal with the maths? So let's deal with the maths. I am going to get rid of this particular screen share um, that, that for now. So please, 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 if you do want to partake and want to ask any questions, can you please note down um, the, the Zoom room and the code uh, and enter via Zoom and feel free to ask as many questions as you want on there, yeah? All right, so let's talk about some of the maths and what type of questions you are likely to encounter that are mathematical, right? So as a starting point, what I'd like you to write down, please, is the formulas for things like marginal cost, average cost, average variable cost. Let's go through those and understand what they are. And then I wanna show you a past paper question from an Edexcel paper and show how you navigate your way through a question like it. Yeah, so our starting point is to go, okay, what is marginal cost? So I will show my screen again and here we go. Right, so marginal cost, if you remember in words is the additional cost or the addition to total cost from producing one more unit of output, right? So if I basically go from producing, let's say nine units to 10 units, whatever the difference was in my total cost when I had nine units compared to 10 units, that will be my marginal cost. Now the maths that underpins that is simply this. We have MC is equal to the change in total cost over the change in the quantity, the output. Very, very straightforward, yeah? Then we deal with things like averages. So if I say average cost, now, the easiest way to remember this is to go, okay, average of anything. So if I say, let's add up our average height or average age, what would you do? You would add up all of our ages and divide it by the number of people that are in the room, right? So we go, okay, average cost then, I take whatever the average I'm trying to figure out, I do the total of it. So I go total cost, TC, and I simply divide it by the output Q. Cool? Right, with that in mind, very quickly, so that we just refresh, if we do average variable cost, so AVC, well, average variable cost is going to be total variable cost divided by Q. Again, what did I do? Whatever average I'm trying to figure out, I turn the A into a T and then I divide it by Q and it will always work. This will always work in that method. So the last one is average fixed cost, AFC. Average fixed cost is going to be total fixed cost divided by output. Nice and easy. Yeah. Let's deal with marginals, uh, revenues then. So that's that's the costs. These are the key things that I need to know for costs. Um, one more thing actually really quickly is totals. So if I say total cost, well, total cost is made up of two things, right? It's made up of your fixed cost and your variable cost. You just add them up. So you have TFC plus TVC. Nice and easy. Right, let's deal with marginal revenue then. So marginal, if you remember again, I said is the revenue that you gain from an additional unit, in this case, an additional sale. So how much does total revenue go up by when I sell one more unit? Mathematically, it's just going to be the total change in total revenue, again, over the change in the output. Easy. Last thing is average revenue. So average revenue is going to be the total revenue. Remember what we did? We basically said, all right, I want to calculate an average. I convert that letter into a T, and I simply divide it by Q. That will always work. So AR equals TR over Q, which you should know, definitely at this stage, is equal to demand as well. Yeah, so the average revenue curve is the demand curve as well. Finally, the last thing is um, total revenue. So if I want to know the total revenue that a firm makes, all I need to do, so think about it. Imagine that we sell these pens for a living and I say to you guys, all right, what is the total revenue that the firm makes? There are two things that I need to know. The first thing I need to know is how much are we charging for the pens, which is basically the price. 
The second thing that I need to know that I multiply it right is how many pens are we selling? That gives us our total revenue. So P times Q. Fair enough? Okay, so that hopefully is a nice little wall up to get you to kind of think along the lines of the formulas. I just want to now show you guys a particular question um, from a past paper that we are going to work through together. Um, I am seeing some of you emailing and question and sending in questions as well. I will address those as soon as possible. But for the time being, I just want to show you guys, I will share my screen in a second. Okay, right. Uh, on the expert tuition website, I don't know if you've seen it before, but it's pretty good. I might be a little bit biased. Um, under past papers, so where you go resources, um, past papers, and then, not that, past papers, A-level economics, yeah. Within the Edexcel one in particular, we have it broken down by unit and by topic. So for example, old spec unit three is basically theme three for you guys now. And in there, there are booklets of questions of past papers. This is one of those mathsy questions that I want to address. And in particular, question number two, once it loads for us. Right, so this is such a typical question that they tend to ask in section A of the Edexcel paper. And even those of you that are not on Edexcel, actually the skills required to answer this question are identical to what you need to know for the mathsy type questions. So the question says this, it says, Lottie runs a tanning shop and the following table shows her costs and revenues for one treatment at different price levels. Some parts of the table are left blank for your own calculations, right? Whenever they leave, or even when they give you a table, I always want you to fill out that table because A, there will be working out marks. So bear in mind, this is old spec, which is why you only have one mark for the multiple choice and then another three marks for the explanation. That's what they used to have it as. In, in the new spec, it would be worth four marks because they would be looking for the calculations as well as they probably wouldn't give you multiple choice. They might just give you like, you have to write out the answer, yeah? So let's see, what, let's see what they've given us and what we can decipher from what they have given us. The first question, and those of you that are on Zoom, uh, feel free to actually answer it. Those of you that are not, you can just write down your answer and compare it. My first question to you is, based exclusively on this table, can we say what the fixed cost is for this particular firm? If you think we can, write down your answer, please. If you are not sure, you can say not sure, I guess. And yeah. Right. The correct answer for anyone that uh, answered it was the fixed cost in this example is definitely £30. Why? Because a fixed cost is a cost that you incur even when you produce no output. The best example is like rent. Do you agree that if we have a chocolate factory and that chocolate factory produces absolutely nothing, that we still pay rent? Well, look at this in this example. The number of customers per day, when it's zero over there, can you see that the total cost is still 30? In other words, for this particular firm, for sure, the fixed cost is 30 pounds. So far, so good, yeah? Right, let's now annotate, and hopefully Zoom will help me with this, um, and figure out what the total cost is then. So we said marginal cost is the cost of that additional unit, right? So if the total cost at the moment is 30 pounds, and then on one unit, the marginal cost was two pounds, what is the total cost for this particular firm? Well, the total cost at the moment is 32 pounds. Agreed? Because I just add two to the 30, and that gives me 32. What's the next unit then? Well, the next unit is going to cost three pounds to make that additional unit. So what's my total cost now? Well, 32 plus three, very easy, is obviously 35. Yeah? Um, bear in mind, by the way, you know, for this exact question, I actually don't need to be calculating the total cost. Um, and, and I'll show you in a moment why, but I just want to do it as practice so that you guys know how to implement or work backwards, whether you have marginal cost or total cost yeah then we have 35 and the next unit gives me an additional cost of four pounds so that's going to be 39 and then the next one is obviously 45 hopefully you're doing it with me and then the last one is 55 nice easy question well a nice easy column to fill out yeah now we don't know as of yet what these two things are they left it blank for us to figure out but there's an easy way of understanding this well what she needs to do is maximize her profits what is the rule for profit maximization well, the rule for profit maximization is simply MC equals MR. Well, I already have marginal cost. I need to get marginal revenue. And think about what the definition of marginal revenue is. Marginal revenue is the addition to total revenue from producing an extra unit of output. Obviously, then, I need to basically write this as TR, total revenue, and this is going to be my marginal revenue. Fine? Okay. So we said total revenue, if you remember, is the price times the quantity. Well, the quantity is zero times 20, obviously, is just going to be zero. There is no revenue at that point. So that's zero. Then we have one times 18, which is 18. Then we have two times the, uh, 16, which is 32. 
Then we have three times, if my maths is not embarrassingly bad, it might be, it's, I believe, 42. If I'm wrong, please tell me. And then we have four times 12, which I believe is 48. And finally, the easiest one of all is five times 10, which is just 50. Fine. Marginal cost. Marginal cost is, so marginal revenue. Marginal revenue is how much revenue we make from producing or selling that extra unit. Well, there's no marginal revenue at the first level of output because there was nothing before it. So just put a dash there. Maybe left it blank there. From zero to one unit, what happened to total revenue? Well, it went up by exactly 18. Therefore, the marginal revenue is also 18. Make sense? From one to two units, we went from revenue of 18 pounds to revenue of 32 pounds. How much did the revenue therefore go up by? That is your marginal revenue. So again, if my maths hopefully is not horrendous, uh, I believe that would be 14. So the marginal revenue on that unit was 14. Then from 32 to 10, I'm pretty sure I can get that one, is 10. 42 to 48, we basically now have six. And finally, from 48 to 50, very straightforward, is two. Nice and easy. So what am I looking for? Now that I fill this out, I look for where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And hopefully you can see that it's clearly at this level of output. And the price is 12 pounds. Now the only option that has 12 in it is D. The correct answer is therefore D. It's 12 to 14 pounds. Once they get to the marginal cost equals marginal revenue point, that's the point at which they kind of stop. They're indifferent about making that level of output. They stop right at that quantity. Hopefully that's a nice little warm up in terms of like the maths. Um, let's do one more and then I'll start doing like a bigger essays and answering some of the questions that are coming through at the moment. So let me clear all my drawings. Uh, let's scroll up. What? Right, this one. So the question says, the table gives weekly information about the possible short run output costs and revenue of a firm making military equipment. Some sales have been left blank for your own workings. Then it says, which level of output would mean that the firm is sales maximizing? Now, if you are on the Educas uh, or the OCR board, sales maximization for you guys is called sales volume maximization. It's literally the same thing, right? Whereby a firm is looking to make as much profit as they can without incurring a loss. Your priority is to sell as much as you can. Quick revision, why? Why would a firm do that? Why would you look to maximize your sales? Well, the answer is by maximizing your sales, you need to offer a low price, agree? In order for you to sell loads and loads and loads of output, you need to offer a pretty low price. Why are you doing that? You're doing that because you're hoping that people start using your goods on a regular basis, they become hooked, and then in the long run, you start to maximize profits. So it's a great way of developing brand awareness and brand loyalty so that people kind of there's exposure to your product, yeah? So anyways, in terms of the rule, the rule for sales maximization or sales volume maximization is where AC equals AR. Because remember, they're looking to only make normal profit. We want to sell as much as they can. They're going to only make normal profit, this particular firm. Okay, let's figure out what we know and what we don't know yet. Well, they've given us all of the total revenue, which makes our life really easy when it comes to average revenue. So let's start with that. Average revenue, if you remember, is the total, total revenue here, divided by the number of units that are produced. Now, to give you even more of a clue or to kind of guide you, they've done the first one for you. Clearly, 40 divided by one is equal to 40, and they have done that so that you can check when you do your calculation, hopefully you don't forget anyway, that theirs has to also make sense. If you do some random calculation with like, I don't know, two, like let's say you divide nine, nine divided by two, I don't know why you do that. You're going to get a really random answer. You go, okay, well, when they did 15 divided by one, based on that, they didn't get 15, so it can't be that. Anyways, right, let's annotate and let's do it together. So we have 60 divided by two, I believe it's 30. 78 divided by three, right? I'm not going to attempt to do that in my head. 78 divided by three is 26. I should have actually done that in my head. That was not bad. 26. 96 divided by four. I think it's 24, but I'm going to check because I don't trust my mental maths. 96 divided by four. Go me. It is 24. 105 divided by five. I think it's 31, no, way, 21. Okay, right, I, I, excuse the zigzag that I, I have here. So 30, 26, 24, 21, cool? Right, this is the bit that's harder though, because I only have the fixed cost. Can you see that? Because the fixed cost here is 10, right? Because when they produce nothing, there was still uh, a cost to incur. And then we can go again, the same order that we did before. We go, the marginal cost is the cost of that additional unit. Well, that additional unit was 15 pounds. So what do we have? 10 plus that 15 is going to give me 25. Again, the way I can check is I know the average cost is total cost divided by output. Well, 25 divided by one gives me 25. I'm on the right track. Then I have 25 plus four, 34. 
Then I have 34 plus 18. I am not going to attempt that, even though I really should know that in my head. 34 plus 18 is 52. Then I add 44 to that next unit. What do I get? 96. Makes sense. And then the last one is 54, so that's 150. Cool. Bear in mind, by the way, I already have the answer here. Uh, because if average cost equals average revenue, do you agree that that means TC equals TR? It's exactly the same thing. Normal profit is revenues equal to cost. Whether it's average or total, it's the same thing. So can you see, I can see where total revenue and total cost equal one another, but just, just for jokes, let's do average cost anyway to make sure that the maths is really solid. So what we have, um, average cost, 25 divided by one is 25. 34 divided by two, 17. 52 divided by three, I'm not gonna try that. 52 divided by three, well, 17.33, cool. Then 96 divided by four, which is obviously is gonna be 24, I'll show you why. And 150, that's 30, yeah? Okay, uh, just out of interest, by the way, just as a little, little bit of re revision as well. Did you notice that when they went from one unit to two units, their average cost fell? What happened? In this example, then, they tapped into economies of scale. So they were, let's say, bulk buying or whatever it is that they did that resulted in the average cost for this firm going down, yeah? But then beyond that point, they have diseconomies of scale because average cost is now rising again, yeah? Anyways, can you see that this quantity of four, total revenue, 96, equals total cost, 96, average revenue, 24, equals, so average revenue equals, yeah, average cost, 24. And that hopefully makes a lot of sense. So far, so good? Okay, right. Let's start with some of your questions uh, that I'm seeing on the chat. Uh, two of you have asked uh, the, the same thing, uh, so, so let me address this question. Um, the question is, how do you analyze or how do you bring in the king demand curve into an essay? Okay, my answer for this uh, is basically throughout the exam boards, uh, but in particular, if you are at Excel, they are not allowed to ask a question explicitly about the king demand curve for at Excel. It is something that if you write about in an exam, you, can, you will be credited, it will be on the mark scheme but they cannot explicitly ask a question about it. So if at this stage you're not comfortable with the King Demand Curve, I genuinely don't think it's something to be worried about. But if you want to as kind of like to add to your armory of different things that you can mention in a question, fair enough. Let's just go through the theory then. Let me share my screen and show you guys how you actually answer a question or how you bring it in. No moment. Right. The, the starting point for the King Demand Curve is to understand that the whole theory is trying to show that in a competitive oligopoly, that it does not make sense for a firm to change and alter their prices. They should not, according to this theory, compete through prices. And this is kind of what the justification for the theory is. So we have quantity over here, cost for slash revenue over here. Yeah. All right. Our starting point is to say, imagine that an oligopoly, let's say Tesco, are operating at this point here. Let's call it A whereby the price they are charging for their goods on average are this P, and this is the number of customers they currently have at QE, right? Now, let's assume that Tesco decide to now raise their price above PE, so anywhere like over here, yeah? The assumption according to the theory is, what will Asda, Sainsbury's and Waitrose, what will they do? Well, according to the theory, those companies will keep their prices unchanged because they think, well, if Tesco raised their price, they now have a higher price relative to us. Loads of their customers will come to us. They will switch over and shop at Sainsbury's and Asda and wherever, right? On that basis, when Tesco raised their price above PE, is demand elastic or inelastic? Well, for Tesco, it will be very, very elastic according to the theory because it goes, the smallest increase in the price, because the goods sold are very similar, they're just branded, you're now gonna switch over en masse basically to other companies. So what will happen is, is the demand curve above that point P is very, very, very elastic, like that. Scenario number two. Scenario number two, in fact, actually, just to like illustrate that as well. So if, let's say, Tesco raised their price a teeny tiny bit, there, P1, right? Look at how much their demand falls by, according to this theory. It's a dramatic reduction in the number of people buying their products. Does it therefore make sense for Tesco to raise their price? Well, here, blatantly not, because their revenue really badly gets affected by this. Scenario number two is that Tesco now decide to reduce their price. What will the other supermarkets do? Well, if I'm Asda, I don't want to lose customers to Tesco, so I'm going to reduce my price as well. Now, the, redu the reduction in price 
we say, yeah, we're going to get a few more customers as Tesco, but are we going to get a dramatic increase in the demand considering all the other supermarkets are also reducing their prices as well? No, not really. There might be a small increase because people can afford to buy a little bit more, but there isn't going to be a wave of customers coming to me from Asda and Waitrose and Sainsbury's because they're also reducing their price. Therefore, below PE over here, any price here, we assume the demand for Tesco will be very, very inelastic. So we're going to draw it like this. Okay. And again, I can illustrate this. So this is, by the way, AR, which is equal to D. I can illustrate this by saying, okay, imagine the price was dropped all the way from PE to P2. Can you see that's a massive reduction in the price? It's a huge decrease. And yet the demand would increase so little. Here we go. P2, I can barely fit it, right? Is it worth it? In other words, a significant reduction in the price leads to a less than proportionate rise in demand. Hence, revenue goes down in that scenario as well. What you notice, by the way, is that in both of these scenarios, the revenue went down for Tesco. According to the King demand curve, then, it does not make sense for Tesco to adjust their prices from point A. They should not move from point A. Prices, therefore, in an oligopoly should be sticky. Right. This is what I would describe as like the more basic diagram. And I don't mind in an exam, especially if you, to be honest, if, if, if you can't develop it that, that well, don't do it. But in case you're on another example, let's say your OCR, let's say your AQA, and, and you kind of need to develop this particular point. Um, in that event, can I show you guys a slightly more sophisticated like adaptation to this, which is to go, okay, we know that marginal revenue is half the slope or double the steepness, if you like, of the average revenue curve. So what's going to happen is this. We're going to go start there and it's going to go sort of like halfway until it hits that dotted line. See that dotted line over here? where the, basically the kink occurs. Now, for those of you that do maths, if you don't do maths, really not a big deal, you should know from your A-level maths that any point like this is called the turning point. And the elasticity, or sorry, the differential of, of a turning point is zero. In, in, in economic terms, the elasticity is therefore zero, which means, if you remember from unit one or theme one, is that demand is perfectly inelastic, and it looks like this. To remember, inelastic, by the way, is what letter does the word inelastic start with? It starts with an I. Looks like that, basically, yeah? So what's going to happen is, is that it's going to go straight down if my board will allow me to do that. And then it starts to go half the slope of this section of the AR curve, yeah? Okay, marginal revenue, therefore, has this funky shape. And now we can do the most basic stuff. So we say, okay, imagine the marginal cost for a particular firm was this, MC1. Profit maximization, as we did in the previous questions about the mathy stuff, was where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Where marginal cost equals marginal revenue exactly here. Agreed? This is therefore the quantity they produce. And to get the price, I always go up until I hit the demand curve and then across, and that's going to be my price. So in other words, for this firm where MC equals MR is there, so they would produce this many units, QE, and they would sell exactly as we said at price PE. Okay. Let's say their variable cost went down. So let's say the price of oil has gone down. Yeah? Marginal cost would shift down. Fine? Well, let's shift it down to like this, MC2. Where is MC2 equaling MR? Well, it's still here on that straight line. In other words, what's the number of units they produce? Well, it's still this. What's the price they still charge? It's still where we go up to the, to the AR curve, still PE. There's no change. And again, if I have like a third marginal cost and so on and so forth, obviously I can keep doing this, right? Well, as long as it's on that part of the MR curve, you're gonna consistently get that level of output of QE and that price of PE, which illustrates that the profit maximizing price for an oligopolist does not change dramatically. Now, in truth, I'm not a big fan. I, I, I always say this to anyone that I teach this of, like it's, it's, it's an easy enough theory to explain, and it can be done as either analysis or evaluation. I'll show you how in, in, in analysis, it would be if the question was like, why would oligopolists be competing through non-pricing strategies? Or why does it make sense for them to not compete with one another through non-pricing strategies? Bear in mind, by the way, this is much more inclined to the likes of AQA in particular, that type of question. Um, but you never know. Like I can't second guess exactly the wording of your particular paper. This could be an analysis and to say it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for Tesco to try to reduce or raise their price because if they raise their price to P1, look at what happens to their demand. It goes down dramatically. If they reduce their price to P2, look at how little the demand increases by. They make way less profit. It doesn't make uh, way less revenue. Sorry. It makes no sense then for them to basically deviate from that quantity and that price. That'll be analysis. Valuation could be an evaluation for a pricing strategy. So let's say they decide to cut their price to try and either deter firms from coming in, so limit pricing, or they might cut their prices to try and push existing firms out of the market, predator pricing. 
evaluation to that could be this. I think there are better evaluations than that, but you could do this. You can go, oh, actually, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for them to do this because look, the profit maximizing level of output for them is still there. Cool. Hopefully that answers the questions uh, in terms of the king demand curve. Um, I, I, like, like I said, if you, if, if, if you are doing a particular at Excel, I would not really worry about it enormously. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, those of you that are on the Zoom, uh, please feel free to send any other questions. Very quickly, going to share my screen for those of you that came in a little bit late with the code for you to be able to enter um, if you'd like to enter and ask a question. There are other questions that I'm going to quickly go through, but in the meantime, I'm going to keep that up. So if you've just joined on YouTube, um, please feel free to drop in drop in on Zoom and send an email over as well. I'm just going to quickly check my emails to see if anyone's sent anything in. And okay. Okay. One moment. Okay, cool. All right, let's do it. So um, in terms of the next topic that I wanted to address, one of the questions that I think is very probable that could come up is to basically talk about mergers and the impact of a merger on efficiency in particular, yeah? So let's just remind ourselves of the different types of efficiencies and then address it from there. So there are broadly four types of efficiencies that you need to know. There are two what we call static efficiencies, though. So if I got a question about like a merger and the impact of that or a monopoly and the impact of a monopoly or even an oligopoly on efficiency, I'd start off with the definitions of the two static efficiencies, starting with number one, which is productive efficiency. Productive efficiency is where a firm is operating at the lowest point on its AC curve, right? So if you're operating at the lowest point on your AC curve, by the way, as a bonus point, it is where you fully tapped into your economies of scale, yeah? Now, mathematically, I will write it on this, and I'll rub that out later. Mathematically, if you're operating at the lowest point in your AC curve, your marginal cost is equal to your average cost. Think about your diagrams. You know that when MC and AC intersect each other, it has to be at the lowest point on the AC curve, right? So that's productive efficiency. Allocative efficiency, which causes a bit more confusion, is basically where a firm is operating at the level of output where their price is equal to marginal cost, right? So P equals M MC. What that basically means is the price, by the way, you derive as uh, from the AR curve. So that, that really means MC equals AR. And when a firm is allocatively efficient, they are maximizing consumer welfare. Consumers, they are as, as well off as they could possibly be, yeah? Now, in, in, in truth, I do need you to remember what it means and to be able to identify on a diagram. But more than anything, I need you to understand when you can bring allocative efficiency into an essay. And the answer is regularly, often. I want it all the time. Whenever the consumer is better off, I don't care why they're better off. If the consumer gets a lower price, if the consumer gets a better quality, if the waiting times are reduced, or whatever the reason is, you are going to therefore, at the end of the paragraph, say, as a result, allocative efficiency has risen. I'll give you a great example. Those of you that are at Excel, June 2013, Unit 3 had a question about egg farming in the EU and how they had like uh, the, the hens had to be like in bigger cages. Or they had to be free roaming. If you don't believe me, check the mark scheme. It says the following. It said, happier hens lay better quality eggs. Therefore, allocative efficiency goes up. Then about you, if I'm sitting in an exam talking about how happy the hen is, I'm thinking it's going terribly. But it was on the mark scheme. And that is an extreme example of what I mean by whenever the consumer is better off, you can say allocative efficiency up. Clear? Right, so we have MC equals AC is productive. MC equals AR is allocative. I would lay out your answer in the following manner. My first paragraph about the benefit of a merger and how I link it into efficiency would be to, to do this. So let's assume it's a horizontal integration. So two firms, same industry, and the same stage of the production process. So let's say two car manufacturing firms. Um, in fact, actually, a pretty decent example is like Jaguar, and uh, Land Rover, they actually did merge, right? So the first thing is that they're better placed to become more productively efficient. So one microeconomic impact uh, or one impact in efficiency is that firms are likely to become more productively efficient. I then develop in the following manner, the 25 marker or the big, big question in your exam. The big difference between old spec and new spec is that in the new spec, it's not about how many points you make. It's about the depth you go into in terms of the point you do make. In other words, it's kind of like economic black, the ability to take a basic concept and flesh it out in as many chains of reasoning as possible. Let me show you a great example of that for a big question. So my topic sentence would have been the impact of a merger or one microeconomic impact of a merger is that firms are likely to become more productively efficient. 
Second sentence. This is because they are better placed to tap into the economies of scale that exist in their industry. After I do that, in the big question, I would define it. I would say economies of scale is where a firm's long run average costs are falling as output rises. Now, this is the difference between the A star candidates, the candidates that get A's and B's, and we're even going to talk below that level. I mean, even an A is insulting to my face. But um, what do they do? The, the A star candidates now go, there's an opportunity for me to get some application marks here. Real world application does not necessarily always mean stats and facts and figures that you memorize. Great. I do know that. Yeah, I know an industry, know like a country for like development. Uh, fine, that's great. However, this is an example of real world knowledge. If I was talking about two car companies, I would now give an example of what type of economy of scale they could tap into. The easiest is purchasing. They can bulk buy. And you could go, for example, the car company can now bulk buy more steel, more rubber, and other parts to build their cars with. Easy peasy, right? If it was two coffee companies, let's say cafes merging, they could bulk buy their coffee beans. Two supermarkets merging, basically bulk buy anything, right? All the things that they sell, right? That counts as real world application, as basic as that is. After I develop the kind of those examples, I would then say the following. I'd say that by doing this, the firm will be operating closer to there. Now, for those of you that are revised, hopefully will know this, the bottom of the AC curve has a fancy name. Let me quickly just show you guys. So the bottom of the AC curve is called this point. So I don't know why it's smudged. But the bottom of the AC curve, that point, is called the MES, which stands for the minimum efficient scale. Basically, it's the lowest amount of output required um, in order for them to um, fully tap into the economies of scale that exist. Yeah? Okay. So they'll be operating closer to their MES. And therefore, the firm is more productively efficient. Fine? Easy peasy. That would be my first paragraph of analysis. And there's a lot of depth. There's multiple chains of reasoning. There's some application in there as well. If the question wasn't about efficiency, by the way, but it was just about the general impact or maybe the impact on consumers, you can very easily go from that point to developing about consumers. How? Well, if the firm has lower costs, do you agree that that can translate into lower prices because their costs are lower? And therefore, allocative efficiency would go up. Consumers are better off. That's our first analysis. The evaluation is really straightforward. The evaluation is actually rather than having economies of scale, they might actually experience diseconomies of scale, right? The firm might become so big that it's hard for them to manage. So they'd be operating beyond the MES. They might experience managerial economy, diseconomies of scale because of the fact that the operation may be so vast and so big, it's hard to get everyone kind of on the same page and coordinate everything. Basically something along those lines, yeah? Second analysis. Second analysis allows us to draw a lovely diagram. We're going to draw the diagram together. And I want to show you guys a systematic approach. There is a YouTube video. If you haven't watched it yet, I would highly advise you watch it. Of a systematic approach to constructing cost and revenue diagrams, you need to be amazing at drawing diagrams. And not only should you be amazing at drawing diagrams accurately, you should be able to do them quickly. Right, anyways. So a merger basically means two firms have come together and are now one company, right? That means they're sharing their customers. There are two sets of customers combining to become one company's customer base, right? What is therefore shifting? Well, what is shifting is obviously the demand curve, which in theme three, we know is the AR curve and AR can't shift by itself. It has to shift with MR, right? The overarching point is going to be their profits are going to go up and therefore they're going to become more dynamically efficient. I know we haven't talked about that, but we will in a second. So what you say is this, another microeconomic impact of a merger is that it's likely to result in an increase in dynamic efficiency. I then briefly explain that by combining the two customer bases, the demand curve will shift out for the newly merged firm. And let us draw that. So, step by step to constructing diagrams. Please, please, please watch this on YouTube if you haven't yet. It is a, probably the most important video I've put up there. And um, step one, for those of you that have watched it, hopefully know is marginal cost. Let's just do it. So MC, pardon my board and the wonkiness. Step two is we draw AR and MR. Now, because I am going to be shifting the AR curve, when I know I'm going to shift my AR curve, I always make sure I've got enough space. So for example, I'm going to start somewhere over there so that when I shift it, I always just start at a higher point and shift it parallel. And will make your life so much easier. Do not start at the same point when AR and MR are shifting. Always start either up if it's going up, if demand is increasing, or down if demand is going to be decreasing. Yeah. So let's draw that. So we have. AR equals D there. This is marginal revenue. Again, those of you that have watched the video before, you now go to the profit maximizing level of output, which is where MC equals MR. 
You then go up to the demand curve to get your price, P1. And then the final thing that I want us to do now is we want to draw the AC curve. So let's make the make super normal profit to start off with. Here we go. I don't know if you noticed, by the way, I purposely put my pen on the MC curve and flick outwards each time from there so that they can't accuse me of not putting it at the lowest point. Remember when MC and AC intersect, it is the lowest point on the AC curve. And now I go up from quantity Q1 till I hit the AC curve. And that's my cost C1. Right, things are going to get messy. So corners. Oh, so the area by the way of profit is going to be this, right? Super normal profit is going to be that. I want to do it in letters. So I'm going to label that as A. This point is going to be B. Cool. So in other words, the initial total of super normal profit the firm is making is P1, A, B, C1. Fine. Okay. Now we said that the combined firm, their demand curve is going to shift out. The easiest thing, like I said, is start at a higher point and just shift it parallel. So we have AR2 equals D2. And this is MR2. Cool. Profit maximization again occurs where MC equals MR, but that's changed now because we have a new MR curve. So MC equals MR is now there. Can we all see that? So this is, I've kind of missed it with my pen. The new quantity is here. Then I go up to the new AR curve to determine the new price. So the price, of course, is going up. P2, yeah. And then finally, I'm going to go up to the AC curve and it's going to hit it on my one there. That's C2. And again, just do letters. Because I'm using Cs for costs on the Y axis, I think it makes sense to skip the letter C in terms of the areas. So I'm going to do this as D. And this point is going to be E. Right, there's a lot going on. And can you see, by the way, by labeling it through letters, you're making it so much easier for the examiner to interpret your diagram rather than shading. I think shading is only if it's a static diagram where nothing is shifting. Yeah? Right, let's summarize our diagram. Well, the diagram shows several things. The first thing that it shows is that the price that the newly combined firm can charge increases from P1 to P2. The second thing it shows is their sales are rising from Q1 to Q2. And the third thing it's showing is their super normal profits are rising from P1, A, B, C1 to P2, D, E, C2. However, there is something that happened that was a bonus that I was hoping would happen, but it didn't have to happen. My costs could have gone down. It did. It could have stayed the same or it could have gone up. Anyone know why it's gone down in my example? It's a very impressive thing to basically um, know, if you do know what I'm talking about. And this is like a, a small thing that I could pass on and write about if I, you know, to give you a bit more depth. The correct answer, and well done if you got this, is that in this scenario, just by coincidence, they tapped into greater economies of scale. They were operating at point B on the AC curve. They're now at point E. By getting bigger, because they have a bigger market share, they can bulk buy more. It's exactly what we said in our first analysis paragraph. Now, we're going to repeat it. We're not going to do a whole paragraph about that. But it's something that we can mention in passing to show to the examiner, I know, right? So we go, price rises from Q1 to P2. Their sales rise from Q1 to Q2. Their costs also fall from C1 to C2, as they are better placed to tap into the economies of scale that exist, and thus will be operating at a lower point on their AC curve. And finally, their profits are going to rise from P1, A, B, C1 to P2, D, E, C2. Every single time you get to the point where you're talking about the firm's profits rising, you have now opened up the easiest chain of reasoning in existence. Once you've done that, I always want you to do the following, especially in the big questions. You're going to go, this additional profit can be invested into the latest technology and into R&D, research and development, basically. Yeah, Give an example of what the firm can do. You can't really go wrong unless you say something absolutely ridiculous. So an example might be, let's say it's two car companies, like I said. If it's two car companies, well, they can invest in self-driving cars. If it's two car companies, they might invest into a wider range of electric cars that have a wider range. I, I don't know what it will be, but my point is, is that it's very easy to say what they could do. If it's two cafes, let's say, I don't know, Starbucks are taking over or merging with another, like a small a company. Well, the extra profits might allow them to produce a wider range of different coffees, blah, 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 right? Different flavors and stuff. And then once you've said that, you wrap that point up by saying this therefore increases dynamic efficiency. Easy peasy. Cool. That is our second analysis for that type of essay. The evaluation to that, you sport for choice, to be honest, in terms of like what you could do. You could either have done X in efficiency, whereby the firm actually becomes so dominant that in reality, they end up incurring costs that are higher than they should be just because there's just a lack of competition. Don't mind that one. I, I, I'm happy for you to have done that one. 
I think the easier one, or the one that I think makes is easier to develop anyway, is that it's going to result potentially in a fall in allocative efficiency. Why? Because if the market share of this firm is now higher, do you agree that that translates into them having more dominance and therefore they can exploit consumers? How? Well, firstly, the product itself is going to become more price inelastic due to a lack of substitutes. There is less choice. So the PED for the product pretty much automatically will become more inelastic. They therefore know that if they raise their price, it leads to a less than proportionate fall in demand for their services because people need it. As a result, their revenue would go up. Consequently, they can easily charge really high prices to consumers and get away with it. If the market, by the way, now has become more oligopolistic, if you like, in other words, because it's more concentrated, it also increases the possibility of collusion. Why? Because it's much easier to coordinate and collude, fixed prices basically, when there's a small number of firms than when there's a large number of firms. Hence why we assume that oligopolies are the most ideal market for collusion to take place, right? In the sense that there's only a handful of them. Whereas like the hairdressing industry, you know, monopolist competition, there's too many of them to coordinate. Someone will break out of the agreement. It won't work. Whereas in a supermarket industry, you know, like what, five or six big supermarkets? Therefore, it's much easier for them to coordinate with one another and collude. I would develop that as my second um, evaluation. Hopefully that's clear. And then you just do a judgment, talk about whether it's, you know, take a side. Is it better? Is it not better? You can argue maybe it is better, but maybe the government should restrict or, or kind of um, ensure they're not abusing their dominance and not exploiting consumers. Something along those lines, yeah? Okay. Um, uh, right, let me have a look at some of the questions that you guys have sent. Cool, right. Um, one of the questions I'd like to address, because this actually is, a topic that is, I think every single exam board has this on their advanced note. It's a big topic and it's very broad, but it's basically government intervention to correct like, market failures. So the question I think that could potentially be asked or something along those lines would be evaluate the view that a tax is more effective than a minimum price scheme in correcting market failures associated with a demerit good, right? So I'll repeat that again, a little bit slower, which says evaluate the view that a tax is more effective than a minimum price scheme in correcting market failures associated with a demerit good. Right. Let's deal with that question. So again, one more time, uh, evaluate the view that a tax is more effective than a minimum price scheme in correcting market failures associated with a demerit good. Okay, let's do it. Well, our starting point, Our starting point is to basically go through what a demerit good is. That's, that's a good starting point, I guess. What is a demerit good? Well, a demerit good is one that is over-provided by the free market. It's over-consumed, essentially, right? Examples would be like cigarettes, um, alcohol. Anything that basically has negative externalities um, in consumption is going to be an, a demerit good. So the definition will be like a demerit good is a good that, the free market, that is over-consumed in the free market economy and yields high external costs. I would, in the introduction here, also define an external cost and give context that we can then frame this question through. So what I mean by that is, so we say external costs are the negative third party spillover effects arising from a private transaction. An example of a market which has demerit goods is alcohol. I would definitely do that. The reason why is because there's actually a real world minimum price scheme in Scotland on alcohol. And I think that's a nice, easy kind of uh, industry to talk about. I would briefly in the introduction also just explain what the external cost would be from, from the overconsumption of alcohol. It could be something along the lines of um, it's um, it leads to more strain on the NHS, obviously, right? And you can go, oh, you're already overstretched the NHS. Um, it could be because of the fact that um, there's more strain on like police services and more crime, things like that. Very briefly, you don't have to go into too much detail in the introduction. Bear in mind, by the way, the introduction is the least important paragraph in the entire big essay. So if you're running out of time, you can skip over this and just start the essay. You need to have a judgment, though. All right, let's go. Our starting point, the way I'd split this up is I would talk about why a tax is good, and then I would evaluate. I would talk about why a minimum price scheme is good. I would evaluate, and then in my judgment, I would take a side. I go, this is better than that, and this is why it's better than that, okay? So our starting point is to do, let's do, I think tax is easier to do. So let's do tax. And I need to make sure that you know how to draw this diagram literally impeccably. Every single part of this diagram needs to be correct. Uh, what I would do as a starting point is I would say the following. It would be my favorite sentence in theme one. It's really sad. I have a favorite sentence in theme one, but here we are. It is the following. The impact of a tax is to internalize the external costs associated with, in this case, alcohol. So the impact of a tax is to internalize 
the external cost associated with whatever market failure you're basically addressing. Okay. So whatever market failure we're dealing with, this is that sentence. You go, oh, if you fix it, we need to do this. Right. There are two diagrams that you can draw here. Let me just go through the basic diagram first. And then the second diagram will depend on your exam board. So I will make it clear what the distinction is. At Excel, I'll have it easier than the rest. All of the rest of you guys are lucky. You have four types of diagrams for your externalities, whereas at Excel only have two. I will, I'll, I'll show you both. Yeah. Anyways, let's deal with just a standard tax diagram. But before that, we basically always say the following is that um, this is because the tax increases the cost of production for, in this case, alcohol manufacturers. So let's go through how to draw a specific tax diagram of price quantity. So hopefully it's a bit of revision for you. And the starting point always is just a standard supply and demand diagram. So imagine this is the supply S1. This is the demand D1. Always get in the habit, by the way, of drawing your equilibriums first. So I don't want my pen is smudging. Drawing your equilibriums first before you shift anything. Okay, so that's P1. Okay, right. And let's just go through like a, a chain of reasoning to understand why the diagram looks like it. Again, not to overly plug myself, but like there is a YouTube video about drawing a tax diagram systematically, step by step, why it looks the way it does. Very briefly though, in an indirect tax, who passes the money over to the government? That doesn't mean who pays it. Who hands the money over to the government though? Is it the consumer or is it the producer? Think about your real world experiences. So if you went to the shop to let's say buy uh, I don't know, can of Red Bull, hypothetically, right? Well, do you pay the shopkeeper, let's say, one pound, and then get on the phone, call Rishi Sunak, hey, right? Rishi, I owe you some tax, and send me your address, mate. Obviously, you know the address, but obviously not, right? That, that's not how it works. What happens is, is that the shopkeeper will price in the tax because they know that whatever sales they make of Red Bull or cigarettes or alcohol or whatever it is that has a tax on it, they're going to need to pay a proportion of that to the government in the form of tax, right? In other words, the supply curve is always what shifts when it's an indirect tax because it is the producer that has to hand the money over to the government. Doesn't mean they pay it, and we'll show that in a second, but they're the ones that manage, they kind of like hand the money over to the government. So their costs are rising. Well, a specific tax is a tax on each unit of a particular good. So let's say this is a specific tax on each unit of alcohol. Well, that would cause the supply curve to shift inwards and parallel. Why parallel? Because do you agree if I pick a point like that on my new supply curve and draw a straight line down like that, that that distance is the same at any level of output? What is that distance? Well, that distance is the tax rate. It's the amount they tax per unit of this particular good. Anyways, we now go to the new equilibrium. Dot down. Q2. P2. Cool. Price has clearly gone up. Number of sales has gone down. But the diagram is not complete yet. What I always want you to do now is put your pen on the new equilibrium. And when you put your pen on the new equilibrium there, you're going to draw a straight line down to the old supply curve. Now, what did I just say that straight line is? That straight line is the tax rates. We're then going to box this off. So we're going to go across like that and across like that. What is this area over here? What is this whole area? That area, and we're going to depict this in a second, is the total government tax revenue. Why? Think about the logic. The tax rate is the height. That's the amount they tax per unit of alcohol in this example. The width is the new sales after the tax. The government can only receive tax revenue on the units that are sold now, not before. So if I put my pen on the old equilibrium as an example there, and I drew a straight line up, that is the tax rate. It's the correct tax rate. But the width of my area would be incorrect because they're no longer selling Q1 units. They're only selling Q2 units. So this 100% theoretically makes sense as the government tax revenue. Fine? Right. What can we now say? Well, now we need to depict the consumer incidence of tax and the producer incidence of tax. Very, very fancy way of saying, how much of this tax does the consumer burden? How much of this tax does the producer burden? Easy, yeah? So the answer to that, the easiest way, or well, the only way I want you to remember it. Now, people try to remember it and memorize it as like the top of the area or the bottom of the area. I forbid you to do that. I, I never want you to do that because it is the opposite in a subsidy and you are so likely to make a silly mistake if you try to memorize. I don't want you to memorize. The easiest way to understand is to go, do you agree the consumer is the person that always pays for the product? Well, what price did the consumer pay for the good initially? They paid a price of P1. What do they now pay for the product following the tax? They pay P2. This 
Therefore, 100% is the consumer incidence of tax. And I always want you to do it like that. Yeah, I never, ever want you to try and memorize it. That's a really silly thing to do. With a subsidy, by the way, obviously it'll be the opposite. But again, the logic is the same. Is the price they used to pay, P1, the price goes down in a subsidy. So that's the difference. That's the consumer subsidy or the consumer incidence of subsidy, if you like. The final thing is obviously there's something left, which is this area. And that is the producer incidence of tax. Okay, so the producer incidence of tax. And then the combination of these two is government tax revenue. Cool. That is a proper diagram now. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I want you to do when you have a question about taxation. You then summarize the diagram, which you basically describe by saying, oh, this causes supply to shift inwards from S1 to S2. The price of alcohol will rise from P1 to P2. The number of sales will decrease um, from P1 to Q2. Now, we actually have to be more sophisticated. We go, price rises from P1 to P2. And there is, right, what is there along the demand curve? Because we were here on the demand curve. Let's see my pen. Hold on. So we were over here on the demand curve. And now we've moved to there. So we went from Q1 to Q2. The way to figure out whether we're dealing with an extension or a contraction is to always look at the quantity. Has the quantity risen or has it fallen? Well, clearly it's fallen. So this is a contraction along the demand curve. It's not a shift, it's a contraction. So we go, the price of alcohol therefore rises from P1, is likely to rise from P1 to P2, leading to a contraction along the demand curve from Q1 to Q2. Right. This paragraph, remember, it's a big question, so I want to develop it a little bit more than that. What I can now develop that particular paragraph with is a cool concept. I will deal with how to deal with this as an externality diagram in a moment. But first, there's a cool word that you can throw in to kind of show off a little bit, which is that in particular, what they can do is they can hypothecate the tax revenue. Hypothecate is spelled like this. So I don't know why my pen is so smudgy. But hypothecate is a fancy way of saying that the government pledge that whatever tax revenue they generate, they pledge to invest it back onto that market failure. Now, if you're going to make this as a point, I recommend you do. A, you have to explain what that term means. So the definition is, um, if they say, oh, they, uh, also the government can hypothecate the tax revenue. This is where the government pledge to invest the tax revenue back onto the original market failure, right? That's what hypothecate basically means then you are obligated to give an example of what they could do with it. Again, there isn't really a right answer here. There are some set things that you can always say. One of them I think is like, oh, they could either subsidize like healthier alternatives. Here, I kind of think it makes sense to say that they could uh, run awareness campaigns, whether that's like TV adverts or you know, campaigns like billboards or whatever, just to highlight the perils of you know, um, uh, excessive alcohol, uh, alcohol drinking. Um, they could run like support groups. Whatever, all of this is basically readdressing the initial market failure. That makes sense. If I was, for example, taxing, let's say, diesel cars, if I wanted to make the point about hypothecating tax revenue, a very easy point to make is, oh, the government could subsidize electric cars, or they could subsidize public transport to incentivize people to now move to public transport. Make sense? That is a really clever point to make in that analysis. You've got to hypothecate the tax revenue. This is what it means. This is an example of it. That paragraph is done. Cool. That's our first analysis um, paragraph. Let's evaluate. And the evaluation here is two things combined into one, yeah? Uh, I, I, I don't actually, no, I lie. I'm going to do that for the evaluation of minimum price if I change my mind. But here, whenever it's a tax question, the go-to evaluation for a tax question is the effectiveness will depend on the PED for the product. Now, I can almost guarantee you that the product is going to be inelastic in demand. Because demerit goods tend to be addictive. Things that are bad for people tend to be quite addictive. And that it's hard to shape that habit. So you go, however, the effectiveness of the tax depends on the PED for, in this case, alcohol. Then you comment on it and explain why you think it will be elastic or inelastic. Like I said, it's probably going to be inelastic from any like previous papers that you can look at. They're pretty much always inelastic. You go, the PED is likely to be price inelastic. Why? Justify why. In the June 2017 paper for Edexcel, they had a question about imposing a tax on sugary drinks like Pepsi, Coca-Cola, stuff like that. My why there in terms of why it's inelastic is A, sugar is habit forming, so it's fairly addictive. But number two is that Pepsi and Coca-Cola have very, very strong brand loyalty built up over years and years and years of heavy marketing. 
So people are not really going to just automatically switch. Similarly, by the way, restaurants are probably tied into contracts. You know how when you go to a restaurant, they typically is in, in their kind of soft drinks, either can offer you Pepsi, the range of Pepsi drinks or the range of Coca-Cola drinks, right? They're in a contract. They can't often turn around to Coca-Cola because the price has gone up now. Oh, that's it. Not buying any of you, off you now. So in, re in reality, especially in the short run, the PED for this good is likely to be price inelastic. So alcohol is going to be price inelastic. As a result, who will burden the majority of this tax, the consumer or the producer? Well, the consumer, because they're kind of addictive, uh, addicted. So the consumer incidence of tax will be bigger. In other words, the, the incidence falls mainly on consumers and thus the increase in the price will result in a less than proportionate fall in the demand for, in this case, alcohol. Therefore, the tax is not that effective in the short run. I guess it depends what you mean by effective. In my opinion, effective would be that there's a big reduction on people that actually consume alcohol, that we move closer to like the social optimum. Well, that's not really going to happen in the short run. So therefore, you go, mm, it's not that effective. Is that fair? Second analysis. We now flip the essay and start talking about the impact of a minimum price scheme. But a bit of word of caution here. There are two types of minimum price schemes. There's a guaranteed minimum price scheme and there's a non-guaranteed. The objectives of these are very different. A guaranteed minimum price scheme is where the government pledge and they guarantee to buy up any excess supply off the producers, normally farmers, at the minimum price. The priority there is to protect the farmers because for them, if the product, let's say they're in a market where the commodity prices tend to be very, very volatile. So let's say the price of like oil or cocoa or whatever it might be, right? The government might want to go, okay, let's try to limit these fluctuations by not allowing the price to fall below a certain level. And we can also guarantee these farmers that we'll buy whatever's left over at the minimum price. That gives them clarity, allows them to invest, it allows them to kind of plan ahead, all of that, right? This is not the same as the one we're doing in this essay. The one we're doing in this essay, they don't buy any of the excess. They're not interested in that. Their priority is just to reduce the number of people that buy this good because the minimum price will make it quite expensive to access this product. You can't easily buy alcohol in Scotland. Yeah. So I would start off with the definition of minimum price scheme. I say a minimum price scheme is where the government sets a legal minimum price that producers cannot sell their good below. Diagram. Diagram is very, very straightforward. It's just going to be this. So let's have it as S1, D1, Q1, T1. Right. The most common error when it comes to minimum price scheme diagrams is that students label or place the minimum price below the equilibrium. Can I just run you through why that is obviously incorrect? Because actually it counts as an evaluation. What I'm going to do in this essay as an evaluation, um, but it, it does count as an evaluation. Yeah. Um, the, the, the reason is because if it were set somewhere over there, right? So let's say it was over here. The impact of it being down there is that you have excess demand. Can you see, because like it would hit the supply curve there, that would be the quantity supplied, but it hit the demand curve over there. Excess demand would signal to the producers what? So imagine that you sell a particular product and at the end of the month, people are calling you up, oh, do you have more of it? Do you have more of this good? That indicates or signals to you that your prices are too low. Raise your price. Now, if the minimum price was set down there, you can't go below that price, but can you go above the price? Well, yeah, you can. And therefore, you're just going to raise your price all the way back up to equilibrium. In which case, what was the point? It had, it had no purpose. It didn't do anything. If you set the minimum price below the equilibrium, we're just going to go back to equilibrium. There's absolutely nothing to this market, fine? So the minimum price has to be therefore set for it to have any impact above. And we have this min price. I'm going to call it P min. Right. In economics, whenever I have a price, I can determine how much is supplied and how much is demanded by simply going until I hit that relevant curve. So from PMIN, I hit which curve is that? Can you see that's the demand curve? Let's go down. I'm going to call it QD to make it quite obvious. That's the demand, quantity demanded. And then it hits the supply curve all the way over there. So that's quantity supplied. Clearly, demand, sorry, supply exceeds demand. So this area or this distance is excess supply. Cool. That's the diagram. We now just summarize the diagram. We talk about how, oh, the higher price results in a contraction along the demand curve from Q1 to QD, as consumers cannot afford to buy as much alcohol at this higher price. Uh, I probably remind them that, you know, this is happening. This happens in Scotland. Um, now, initially, there's an extension along the supply curve because producers are incentivized by the higher price. So we have an extension from Q1 to QS, right? But the problem is, is that 
you now have excess supply. So imagine you are a manufacturer, you sell alcohol, you have loads of excess supply. In a normal free market economy, that would signal to you that your prices are too high. Reduce your price to eliminate the surplus. Can you do that here? Well, obviously not, because it's a minimum price. It's illegal to go below this minimum. Therefore, eventually, do you agree producers are going to realize, why am I making this many units each month and being left with all this excess when the amount that's being bought is just this? Now, you never draw this, but in reality, do you know what ends up happening? And you describe it in words, is that now in the long run, eventually producers realize there is no point in producing QS units. They will therefore restrict their supply. It becomes there. That becomes the amount they produce, QD. Why would I make more than QD if I can't sell beyond QD? There's no point, right? So they eventually will eventually they'll get to this quantity QD, yeah? Now, how do I develop this particular paragraph so that it's not a repetition of what I've already said in the taxation paragraph? Because they're very similar. I would now talk about how the higher price for alcohol may incentivize individuals, consumers, to switch to substitute goods. And every time we talk about substitute goods, opportunity to show off, you go, with a positive XED, because you obviously knew that, right? With a positive XED, and they give an example of something. Now, I, I, I don't drink myself, so I don't really know what the opposite or what the a substitute for, um, for, for alcohol is. I don't know, Red Bull, does that count? I don't know, water, right? Fruit drinks, stuff like that. So you just give an example of a substitute good and go, look, that now becomes more alluring or it becomes uh, a bit more attractive because relatively, it's cheaper than alcohol is. That's your analysis, cool? Those are the analysis. Now, the evaluation. This particular evaluation depends on the actual question itself. Alcohol, it works really well. Cigarettes, works really well. If it was something like soft drinks, like 2017, not so well. But the point I'm making is the evaluation here is that individuals might turn to the hidden economy. Yeah. The hidden economy is basically where, obviously, like illegally smuggled products of basically sold in, the, in, the, in that market. Um, several problems with this, two problems really. Uh, number one is, um, to be fair by the way, I, I, I wanna change this a little bit, sorry. I, the reason why is because, you know how I said for a tax, do PED, and, and normally it would always be PED as your main evaluation for tax. I want to instead to be moved the evaluation that we did for tax here. I'll show you why, because I can make a better evaluation using tax for that point than I can for minimum price. So I go, uh, you know, the PED point we did about tax, it works just as well, word for word, right? Whether people really reduce how much they demand depends on the PED for this product. It's probably inelastic. Therefore, it's not going to be that effective. It's not going to have that much of an impact on individuals that there's a higher price. Obviously, just remove the words tax in that evaluation. Now, if we went back to tax and evaluated that way, I want to make a broad point. There are two evaluations that I can do in that one paragraph that always, always, always will work. Well, the second one always works. The first depends on the context. The overarching point is that the intervention might, the taxation might eventually result in, in government failure. The reason why, number one, is because of the hidden economy. Now, the hidden economy, the way I can develop that particular paragraph is that illegally smuggled cigarettes raise two significant problems. One, the government lose out on millions, sometimes billions of pounds of tax revenue. That's the first problem. Second problem, is that those products are unregulated. Therefore, the actual chemicals inside them, whether it's like alcohol or whether it's like um, uh, cigarettes, are likely to be even more harmful than the cigarettes or the alcohol that you would buy over the counter. Therefore, people consuming this, it's even worse for their health. The external costs are even higher than it would be if it was bought kind of through legal means. That's the first chain of reasoning or the, the chains of reasoning for um, smuggling. Second type of government failure that we could deal with. And this one always works for tax. This is always, always there. So if you just do this, this is more than enough and it will always be on the mark scheme. Indirect taxes are always regressive in the sense that it impacts low-income households more than high-income households always. Think about a tax on cigarettes. So let's say the tax on cigarettes is about £4.50. Do you agree that £4.50 for a multimillionaire, a billionaire is nothing? £4.50 for someone on minimum wage is a very sizable amount of money or a lot more than it is for a millionaire. Therefore, indirect taxes are always regressive, meaning that it's going to impact low income more than high income. And thus, that tax will widen income inequality, government failure again. Easy peasy. Those are your evaluations. The judgment for this essay, by the way. So I would basically say this. I'd say that on the balance of evidence, a tax is, more, is likely to be more effective than a minimum price scheme. Let me justify why I believe that and why you should probably write this. They both, do you agree, if I look at the diagram, so if I look at the taxation diagram over here, 
Tax causes the price of the good to go up. So does a minimum price scheme. The tax causes the number of units to be consumed to go down. So does a minimum price scheme. They both do the same thing, right? There's one difference though. And the one difference is that a tax, the government also generate tax revenue, which they can, fancy word time, hypothecate and therefore address the market failure through two avenues. They can subsidize the old healthy alternative or awareness campaigns or whatever it might be. And that is a really high level of judgment because you justified why you thought tax taxes were better than minimum price and gave policy advice that the government need to pledge that they invest that revenue in whatever it is that you said they should invest it into. Is that hopefully clear? Right, before I answer some of the other questions, I know that some of you are answering, I'll answer as much as I can. I, I mean, we were scheduled to go to nine o'clock. We can go a little bit longer if you guys want to, uh, if, if anyone is still here watching this, I don't even know. Um, but I just want to address the um, taxation dealing with an externality diagram. If you are not at Excel, watch this. If you are at Excel, you can close your eyes or, or, or not, 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 not pay attention too much to this. Um, but I, I will do it for the at Excel version as well in a moment. But non at Excel, you guys need to understand externalities as both consumption or production, positive and negative. Yeah. So clearly here, alcohol is a negative consumption externality. This is the step by step that I want you to take to figure out how to draw a diagram like this. The first thing that you do is you go, OK, a negative um, consumption externality, consumption, the word consumption, is that to do with benefits or costs? Well, think about it. You consume something and you get benefits, right? So if I consume a chocolate bar, every additional bar of chocolate that I eat, by the way, I'm going to get less and less benefit from it, which is why benefits are downward sloping. So because we're dealing with a, a consumption externality, the consumer, think about like demand, it's going to be two slightly pivoted downward sloping lines. Now, when I do it pivoted, people sometimes gasp and go, oh, we did it parallel at school. It's okay if you've done it parallel at school, you can do it parallel. It's technically meant to be pivoted, but whatever. Yeah. If there are two down, downward sloping lines, it follows that there must be only one upward sloping line. And I can label that upward sloping line immediately. Every single externality has two players. The private party, the individual or firm that's going to do the thing that's going to cause the externality. And then everyone else is basically social, society. So I can go marginal, M, private, and upward sloping lines are always cost lines. So MPC equals marginal, M, S, C. Cool? The next step that I always want you to go is, go, okay, can you see there are two points of intersection there and there? Dot down and across from these points of intersection, please. That will be the next step. You then ask yourself a very basic question. You go, you go, all right, is it a negative externality or a positive externality? Well, this clearly is a negative. Negative means that we are doing too much of something that's bad. So there's too many people consuming alcohol. Right, watch this. I always want you to think of it in terms of the quantity, and that's how you're always going to get it right. There are two quantities, one, two. Which one logically represents doing too much of something? Well, obviously not number one. It will be number two, right? So this is therefore 100% QE, the market equilibrium. And that's the price they're currently paying for it, PE. Yeah? At the same time, the, uh, this, this point here is going to be called QS. You can label it Q star, I don't mind which is the social optimist, ideally what we would want to be producing in order for there not to be a market failure, fine? We now do the following. Do you guys agree that this is, given this the quantity, this is the equilibrium, that particular point there must be the equilibrium. And if you see, there is only one downward sloping line that we've not labeled yet that goes through that equilibrium. That line, it does not matter which externality diagram you're doing. It does not matter whether it's negative, positive, consumption, production, I don't care that line must 1 million percent be a private line because equilibrium will always occur where private benefit and private cost intersect. So this therefore is M, P, and because it's downward sloping, it's going to be a benefit line, M, P, B. Finally, that therefore must be M, oh, what happened? M, S, B. Fine? Okay. This is the, and the last thing, by the way, so is the welfare loss triangle. Well, we put our pen on the equilibrium. If you put a pen on the equilibrium, you can't really get this wrong. You're connecting up or down to connect to, to make the triangle. Is our welfare loss okay? It is imperative to understand that in terms of externality diagrams, marginal private cost, this point here, is the supply curve. Marginal private benefit is the demand curve. They are the same thing. So, what did we say a tax does? An indirect tax causes the supply curve to shift. 
But I want to shift it to a very, very specific point on this diagram to address this market failure. We ideally want to be operating at the social optimum, right? What is the social optimum? The social optimum is this quantity here, QS, yeah? I will, I've seen someone raise their hand I'll, 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 in a second. Um, the question, by the way, one of the questions, is this not at Excel as well? At Excel, they only require you to do negative externalities as production externalities and positive as, as um, consumption externalities. So you, you wouldn't draw this. I, I will draw the at Excel one just after this. Yeah, you'll see it in a sec. So here, I want to achieve this quantity QS. And what I want to do is I want to shift the supply curve exactly to the quantity QS on the demand curve. So if I go up from that point, can you guys see? This is my demand curve, right? That exact point there. So if I got up there, that is where I need you to shift your MPC curve to MPC plus tax. And if you notice, by the way, the price is also going to go up. That's P2. And now the externality is addressed. We have corrected the market failure associated with this externality. So again, to be clear, this is the non, um, uh, non NXL uh, guys. At Excel, this is your diagram. So this is this is everyone else. At Excel, much easier. All you have to know is negative externality in the context of production. So you don't even need to distinguish between production and consumption. You go negative externality. Is that to do with costs or benefits? Well, the word negative is cost. So we're going to draw two slightly pivoted upward sloping lines. If there are two upward sloping lines, it follows that there must only be one downward sloping line like that. And I can label that straight away. Marginal private benefit equals marginal social benefit. Again, same thing, two points of intersection, dot down. There, there, and across. And we say the same thing again. We go, all right, is if it's negative, am I doing too little of something or am I doing too much of something? Well, am I doing too little or too much? Well, it's too much. Therefore, the equilibrium must be the second quantity here. Q, E, Q, S, P, E, P, S. Right, again, I put my pen on the equilibrium, this. Can you see that only one of the upward sloping lines goes through that point? That must be private, it has to be. MPC, this therefore is MSC. Welfare loss, put my pen on the equilibrium, and that's my welfare loss. Okay, again, the same thing. I want to basically shift the supply curve to the social optimum to eliminate the market failure, to eliminate the welfare loss. Well, what I do is from QS, I want to hit it at the demand curve. The demand curve is right there. Shift it parallel right through this exact point here. MPC plus tax. And voila, you have your diagram, yeah? Those of you that are not at Excel, by the way, that is still your diagram for a negative production externality, yeah? So if it was a negative production externality and they were taxing that, that good in the production process, that would be the diagram that you could draw, yeah? Cool. Hopefully that now addresses that question in, like, entirely. Okay, some of the questions that are coming through. Um, are there any diagrams that you would consider to be relevant for nationalization and privatization? Okay, it's a good question. Um, it, uh, by the way, it depends on, on your board. If you are at Excel, whilst nationalization and privatization is a potential topic in terms of the, uh, the list, the advance notice, I don't think they're going to ask about that. I want to look like an absolute idiot in, 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 in nine days' time. Um, partly because they asked about it in the 2020 paper and they did quite a lot on that, on like the rail network. And that's the only real industry that I think makes a lot of sense for them to even have any relevant data on for nationalization and privatization. So I think it's much more likely if it does come up, I don't even think it will come up. But if it does come up, it will be like a very small question in section A, like defining it. To be clear, nationalization is where a privately owned entity is moved into the hands of the public sector. The government basically runs it and vice versa. Privatization is where something that was publicly held is now put into the hands of the private sector. This question really, by the way, it should be, is about the impact of competition. Why? Because privatization in theory should result in more competition. When something's nationally owned, typically that means it is the only supplier of that good. So for example, British Gas were at one point the only supplier of gas and electricity in the UK. Then under Margaret Thatcher, the government basically privatized that industry and you had a few firms coming in. So the first analysis in terms of like why privatization is good is you go, oh, it's going to result in more competition. Therefore, consumers get more choice. It translates into the demand for the good becoming more price elastic because there's more substitutes. The price they pay might go down. That could be like one paragraph. Another one is that, oh, because of the added competition, how can firms differentiate themselves? One is through lower prices, but two is through higher quality or improved customer services. So whatever profits they generate, they could invest into improving like, you know, the, the, the customer services, the quality of their goods, blah, 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 right? 
Now, there isn't an obvious diagram here. There isn't like a diagram that stands out as like, oh, you have to do this particular diagram, yeah? Um, but I think in one of my evaluations, I would draw this diagram, and I'm going to show you on my board in a second, which is one of the strongest arguments against any form of competition is if the market resembles a natural monopoly. And can I just explain why this is? Because monopoly is pretty much ex you know, on everyone's list of topics this year. Again, I don't think they'll ask a question about it um, as, as a big, big question uh, for those of you that are at Excel. Those of you that are not, um, I don't know your board as well, but like I suspect that if they've asked about it recently, it decreases the probability, but, but you never know. Anyways, let's, let's deal with it regardless. A natural monopoly, if you remember from the definition, is where um, it's a market where the initial fixed and sunk cost is astronomical, like it's so high. A brilliant example of that is London Underground or Thames Water. Think about the cost involved in digging up the rail network or the underground network system in London. We're not talking like even millions here. We're talking billions, possibly trillions of pounds, right? So it's a massive, massive cost. This alters the shape of the AC curve. The AC curve normally is like a U shape, right? Well, now, rather than a U shape, it's going to take this shape. If you're on the OCR board, you might recognize in the mark scheme, it sometimes says um, the L-shaped AC curve. AQA also sometimes describe it as that. You don't need to describe it as that, but you can, right? So here's, here's my AC curve in a natural monopoly, right? And the rationale then is this. Imagine the maximum number of units that could be produced of this good is over here somewhere, right? But initially, hypothetically, we have five, uh, five firms sorry, providing an equal share of the market's output. So I kind of make this numer numerical. So let's say this is millions. Okay, so let's say that the maximum amount is 100 million, yeah? If we have five firms, each producing an equal amount of this market's output, do you agree that they're only producing 20 million, which is somewhere over there? Look at, so let's describe that as Q1. Look at the average cost per firm. And I exaggerated it on purpose, by the way. If, if they only produce a segment of the market's output. It's an absolute disaster. Their cost is so, so high. One, they're super productively inefficient. And two, in order for this firm to survive, do you agree that they need to charge an extortionately high price to consumers just to survive? Is that fair? Well, that's all really bad for allocative efficiency as well, then, right? Whereas in this scenario where one firm produces all of the market output here, so call that Q2, this firm can spread its cost over a large enough output, C2. Look at their cost by comparison. In that scenario, then, it is so much better to have one firm and only one firm providing this good, which is an argument in favor of nationalization, in which case that would be the diagram I draw, yeah? Um, and again, this is an argument against privatization. Oh, look, privatization might result in more firms entering, but the market might be a natural monopoly. So having more competition is not a good thing because it would lead to higher prices for consumers. It would lead to massive inefficiency in terms of productive inefficiency, massive inefficiency in terms of allocative inefficiency and stuff like that, right? Um, the last evaluation, by the way, of like privatization, uh, and I guess like is, is, is again going to be an argument in favor of nationalization, then is even if it's not a natural monopoly, certain industries, the barriers to entry are massive. It takes a lot of output to be able to tap into the economies of scale that exist in certain industries. Therefore, very few firms will have the muscle, the financial muscle, to be able to enter that market anyway. In which case, what type of market structure is it likely to actually materialize? Is, is likely to materialize probably an oligopoly. And it's exactly what happened in the energy market in the UK, by the way. In the energy market in the UK, um, up until I think around January 2013, there's, 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 there's a paper, Jan 2013, unit three, um, has the six firm concentration ratio. They're called the big six, the big six energy companies. And that is what the big six, the, the six firm concentration ratio was until recently. It was 99%. In other words, these six firms made up pretty much the entirety of the, the market. Do you agree then, theoretically, it makes it far easier for them to collude? And if they wanted to, they could probably do it, right? This, the, this is the second bad thing about privatization. That is you go, oh, actually, only a handful of firms are going to enter the market. This results in a lot of oligopolistic market structure assembling, and the consequences of that are very bad for consumers because of higher prices and, and, and all of that good stuff. Yeah? Is that hopefully pretty clear? Yeah? Okay. Um, just to wrap up, um, there is quite a few questions that I haven't actually answered. How would you analyze a payoff matrix for a game theory question? Okay, um, good question. Um, a payoff matrix is a great way of basically illustrating um, the outcome of a game in an oligopoly. Yeah, again, this is going to be variant upon the exam board. If you are at Excel, I don't think it's the end of the world, and I don't think you necessarily need to memorize a payoff matrix. Yeah, but if you are going to do a payoff matrix in your answer, 
It's more as an evaluation than it is as an analysis. And I would use it to evaluate, but I think it's just as effective explaining it, the uh, prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma, just to remind you guys of what that is. So let me just go through like a made up example. Imagine that um, myself and uh, someone called John have committed two crimes, yeah? The first is a fairly petty crime. It's not that serious. But the second crime is far more serious. The problem is the, poli the police only have enough evidence to charge us for the petty crime. So then I put me and John into two separate cells with no way of communicating with one another. And they say the following to each other, to us. If, Ahmed, if you confess and John doesn't confess, you will get immunity and he will get 10 years prison time. Vice versa, if you don't confess and he does confess, he'll get immunity, you get 10 years. If neither of us confess, we will only get two years prison time because they can only charge us for the petty crime. And if we both confess, we're both going to get five years prison time. Now, there's a lot going on here. So this is where payoff matrix is very useful because it allows us to basically put in numbers what we just described. So let me put that in a payoff matrix like this. So here, here I am. And then we said John. Right. So the two moves that I have were confess. I'm just going to write don't for don't confess. And the same thing was true for John, right? His was confess and then don't. Right. The outcome of a game is called the Nash equilibrium. And there's a way of figuring out how to arrive at it. I'll show you guys in a second. But essentially, if I confess and John confesses, we both get five years prison time now. I don't know about you. Prison is not a good thing. So it has a negative. So you go minus five, minus five. Right. To be clear, by the way, the number on the left will always be the utility or the outcome for the player on the left hand side. The number on the right is always what the top player gets. Yeah, remember that. Then we have a scenario where I don't confess and he does confess. Well, I'm going to get 10 years prison time. He's going to get nothing. I then, in this scenario over here where I confess and he doesn't confess, well, I get immunity. He gets 10 years. And finally, if we both don't confess, we both get minus two, minus two. What? Okay. If you don't know these two people and you could choose one of these four outcomes for them, that is the best for them collectively. Which is blatantly the best outcome for these two, for me and John? Obviously, the best outcome is this, right? Minus two, minus two. But well, that is easily the best of the outcomes for us collectively. We're going to prove that that is never, ever the equilibrium of the game. It's never the Nash equilibrium. We'll never get to that outcome. And the way we can prove it is to play the game. Again, if you are in, um, especially educast, they tend to like to ask questions like this. Um, you definitely need to know how to calculate uh, the Nash equilibrium. At Excel, yours are so basic. I mean, if you look at the um, oligopoly booklet we put together on our website, honestly, like it beggars belief how easy your payoff matrix typically is on, on questions on payoff matrix. They've never asked a hard question on payoff matrix. Anyways, right. With this in mind, this is how we play it. The way you can figure out the Nash equilibrium is to go, all right, imagine that I am, let's be John first. I am Ahmed. So let's do John, right? And we go, all right. If I'm John and I assume that Ahmed is playing confess, in other words, I'm only looking at this row, yeah? I ignore all of this at the bottom. This is irrelevant to me, the don't, yeah? So I go, all right, imagine I'm John, and I go, let's assume that Ahmed plays confess. Is it better for John to confess and get minus five or to not confess and get minus 10? Clearly, minus five is better than minus 10. Right? I'm going to underline that move. So the better move for him was to confess and get minus five. Scenario number two, we're still John, but now we go, all right, assume that Ahmed is playing don't confess. Is it better for John to confess and get zero or to not confess and get minus two? Well, zero is better than minus two, right? Again, it's better for him to confess. He has what we call a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is a strategy where you play a particular move irrespective of what the other player does. It didn't matter what I was doing. It always made sense for John to play confess. Let's reverse the game now. We now play as me. And we go, all right, imagine that John is playing confess. I'm only looking at this row here, yeah? Is it better for me to confess and get minus five or to not confess and get minus 10? Obviously, it is to confess. So I'll underline that. That's my better move. Scenario number two, let's assume that John is playing don't confess. Is it better for me to confess and get nothing or to not confess and get minus two? Well, obviously, nothing is better than minus two. I confess as well. Did you notice that my dominant strategy was identical to his, which makes sense because this is what we call us a symmetrical game, right? Obviously, we have the same dominant move. What is the outcome of the game? The outcome of the game with the Nash equilibrium then is that we both end up confessing. We reach what we call a suboptimal outcome, an outcome that doesn't maximize either of our utilities. This is where you can bring it in. So as an evaluation, you go, oh, it doesn't make sense for them to basically do this. Now, um, when, I, when I teach this, often people go to me, right, fascinating, amazing, wow, really, I understand it in terms of this. 
how is that economics? Like how, how do, what, what link is that to economics? Well, imagine rather than it saying Ahmed and John, it said Tesco, Asda. And rather than confess and don't confess, the options may have been low price, high price. Whereby the best outcome for them was to collude and play high price, high price. But the incentive to break out of a collusive agreement it tends to be so high that in the long run, they end up undercutting one another and playing low price, low price. Prisoner's dilemma, therefore, illustrates that actually collusive agreements tend to break down. Then there's always an incentive for someone to either whistleblow, which is kind of like to snitch on everyone and therefore get immunity, or to just undercut. Because if you undercut and charge a lower price, their customers are going to come to you, right? And then they probably retaliate, they will retaliate by offering a lower price as well. You end up in a, in a, in a price war. That is the only time really that I would use a payoff matrix. But you can explain what I just explained in words. So it's not an essential thing, but it's a useful thing. I probably would memorize a payoff matrix, not this one. I would change it to like Tesco as the high price or collude or, or yeah, high price, low price, something like that. Yeah, cool. Right. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, and then we'll wrap it up. What is the best second analysis point for the positive externality of the vaccine? Okay, externality type questions, by the way, I'm especially positive. Now, if I were to predict, and if a question did come up on externalities in the big section for, um, for, for you guys, and pretty much across the board, I suspect, just because of what's happened over the last year or so, the positive externality is fairly topical because of the vaccine rollout scheme, right? The way you answer it, though, is that one of your paragraphs is all about the private benefits, Private benefits are the benefits internal to a transaction, the benefits you gain from doing that thing. So what are the private benefits of you being vaccinated? There's quite a lot of things that you could talk about here. Now, if there's data, you obviously use the data. But if you have 25 market, big question, you can just use your own knowledge. First thing about private benefit is that you are basically less likely to get COVID or have as, as negative an impact to COVID if you were to get it. Two, it's really, really useful in terms of like travel because of the fact that it's easier for you to now move between different locations to go on holiday. You don't need to necessarily do PCR tests and all that. Now, you guys can flesh this out. So essentially, the private benefit is one whole paragraph and that would be the first thing. This therefore means your second analysis is all the external benefits, yeah? Bear in mind, by the way, I think externalities is a topic. If it's like a data response, it's nice. If it's a 12 marker, as a 15 marker, 10 marker, lovely, no problem. Not a massive fan of externalities in isolation as a big, big question. And the reason why I'm not a big fan is because you encounter issues like this, where you're like, how do I flesh this out in enough detail to get into the top bracket? External benefits, though, we can properly flesh out. We can go, oh, external benefits are there's going to be less strain on the NHS. It allows them to basically have less hospitalizations. There'll be less strain on government finances uh, because of the fact that we don't have to go back into lockdowns and therefore they don't have to uh, um, run support schemes like furlough and things like that. It's going to result in higher worker productivity because people are going to take less time off uh, being sick. Uh, things like that, right? I mean, it's more likely to attract, let's say, FDI and like TNCs might want to come set up in a country where the vaccine, um, the number of people that are vaccinated is quite high because of the fact that, that you know, they're, they're less likely to get sick and things like that, right? Those would be my analysis. Now, I would, by the way, even if it's a big question, do all of my analysis for an externalities question first, then I would do the evaluations, fine? So it would be, um, you know, kind of de define key concepts. And then I'd go private benefit. This is what it is. These are examples. Here you go. Leave a line. Go external benefits. These are the external benefits. And then, of course, you draw the diagram as well, by the way. You draw a positive consumption externality, whether you're at Excel or another example, it's the same, same type of diagram. It's a positive externality diagram, yeah? Um, and then you just evaluate. Uh, but, but that's basically the analysis. But I, I'm, not, I'm not as comfortable. I guess it depends on what the other question is when you get a choice. But I, I don't think it's the easiest topic to develop in huge amounts of detail, but it's a very easy topic to apply from data. So if it's data response, lovely. If it's like a, you know, like a 10 marker, 12 marker, even 15 marker, no problem. 25 market is a bit more, yeah. Um, they asked, I think, for example, in June 2018, uh, an externalities question. Um, what was it, 2019? No, it was 2018. Yeah, 2018, they asked an externalities question. And in truth, I think that I would have done the monopoly question, which was about, about, about um, Apple. That was a much easier question about Excel. Yeah. All right. Um, other questions? Let's have a look. Um, can you go through the micro impacts of ULES and what diagram to use? I may indeed. Right, really quickly. Um, we've actually done it to a large extent because ULEZ is like a tax. It pretty much is, right? So it's essentially a taxation to deal with a negative externality. So they're targeting specific cars like diesel cars that are high emitters of carbon emissions, right? 
So you start off with my favorite sentence in your first analysis. You go, oh, the impact of ULES is to internalize external costs associated with, in this case, car usage. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, you then draw, let me pick up from that. You draw, oh, it's, it's this, it's this one. Um, if you're at Excel, you draw this. You just don't write plus tax, you write plus ULES. Okay. I mean, you, you, if you wrote tax, you would not be wrong. Plus ULES. And if you are other exam board, here's your diagram, plus ULES. And you develop that whole paragraph, yeah? You could talk about, oh, they could hypothecate um, the revenue they generate because there's money being paid, right? If you're a car that doesn't qualify for ULES, for, for, by the way, for those of you who don't know what ULES is, I'm just saying it, ultra low emission zones, so extended within, uh, across London, any cer certain types of cars, they have to pay, I think like 12 pounds a day. It might be more, or it might be less. Probably worth checking out what it is so you have some real world knowledge. Um, so that, that would be the, um, the, the analysis, yeah? Uh, and then the, uh, so then they can hypothecate, so you say hypothecate the tax revenue as well, the government could use it to like subsidize um, public transport. Second analysis, I would be talking about how the higher tax or the higher cost gives a greater incentive for people to switch to substitute goods that have a positive XCD. Um, the XCD being like, I don't know, uh, so the, the substitute goods being like public transport or electric cars, cool? And then you just do the evaluations as we did before. So it depends on the PED. It's probably going to be very elastic in the short or fairly elastic in the short run. People are fairly used to using their cars and not really going to like shift that quickly. Um, also, you know, within the PED point, I think a really clever point to say is the XCD between diesel cars and electric cars might not be that high for so many people. In other words, it might be fairly inelastic. In other words, it's weak. Why? Because think about practically what you need in order for you to get an electric car. You probably need a driveway to get an electric dock to, to like charge it. And therefore, it's not really that close a substitute yet for enough people. That's a really clever eval evaluation, by the way. Yeah. Um, the second evaluation is, is the easiest in the world. You go, oh, it's, it's regressive. It's regressive. It's going to impact low income households more than high income households. Worse is income inequality, government failure. Cool. Um, who is the supply in this case? Okay, fair enough. I know that we're shifting in the su supply curve. Um, I guess you yourself are the supplier in this case. Uh, you, you'd be considered to be like the supplier. So they wouldn't penalize it. I, I understand technically, yeah, it would be like almost the demand curve should be shifting inwards, um, but you should be getting all of the marks if you should sh uh, shift supply inwards. But it's a fair question. I understand what you mean. Yeah. And that, that, that's kind of how I would deal with like a ULES question. It would be like a, like, like a cost. Is that clear? Cool. Right. I will very quickly just check my uh, email see if anything new has popped in. I hope this was mildly useful. Um, those of you that have attended this or you are watching this back later on, on YouTube, um, there is a little added benefit if you are at Excel. Um, as you can tell, at Excel is the board I specialize in. It's my, uh, the one I know better. Um, if you would like, can you please email me the following? So my email is the following. So ahmed.alaskari, I should know how to spell my surname, at, and then expert, lifeintuition.co.uk. Right, it took me an absolute age to put this together, um, but as a reward for you being part of the session, hopefully it's useful, um, please email me and I will send over a document that I have put together for this, specifically for Edexcel's advanced notice of questions that I think could come up, of the questions I think you should be preparing for from past papers and like revising from, uh, and hopefully you'll find that quite helpful. Um, you may already have it. I have sent it to several schools and they may be distributing it if they feel like it to you. Um, it will go public and I, and I will put it up on the website soonish, but you guys can have first dibs if you like on the, on, on the, on the document. And yeah, I hope this was helpful. Uh, sorry for the slight delay in getting it started. Uh, and sorry for the fact that you couldn't type anything I believe on YouTube, but you could have on Zoom. And yeah, good luck for your exam. I'm sure you guys will do very, very well. And 